guys, Miss Kulkarni here. So, in this video, we will talk about chiral auxiliary. What are these things and how do they work? What is the mechanism and what is such a big deal that I am making this video and you guys are watching this video. So, let's find out more about chiral auxiliaries. Here's the deal. These are chemicals. They are reagents. The only thing is they are chiral reagents. And we talked about what chirality means and what a chiral reagent is. Also, they should be readily available or can be easily made. And where do we use those? We use them in synthesis and in synthetic routes when we have to control the exact configuration of the stereo center in chiral carbon. So that's where these come handy. Now we are going to find out how these chiral auxiliaries work. But in short, they provide most practical and also extremely reliable procedures. And also these processes are very efficient. So they can be used for making any compounds which have stereo centers, not just one, but multiple stereo centers like Taxol. And here is some history of chiral auxiliaries. The very first chiral auxiliary was introduced by Dr. E.J. Corey and that was back in 1978. There is also a classic Cori synthesis, although he used it for synthesis of prostaglandin. We will talk about that maybe in the next video. But what he used was this compound 8-phenyl menthol. And that's the structure which we got over here. You can clearly see it's a chiral molecule and it has got some chiral centers. Okay, then it was chiral mandelic acid and that was introduced by in 1980. Then came binol and I have used binol which was introduced in 1983. You know how the binol name came? It's by stands for 2. That N which we have is naphthalene. So we have two naphthalene rings and of course oil stands for two hydroxy groups. So it is one one prime binaphthalene and two 2 prime OL. That's what is called as binol. So what do we have here? We have a cyclohexane ring. To that we have OH group. That's what we got with cyclohexanol. And the numbering is going to begin with this one. So that will be 2. At position 2 what we have is a phenyl group. So that's the way we got to phenyl and why do we use the word trans look at the bonds these two bonds if you look at that the substituents are exactly opposite in geometrical position both the substituents OH and phenyl group are in trans position so that's the way we get the name trans to phenyl and cyclohexanol and did you notice it has the active chiral centers? Can you spot those? I can easily find one. This is the one. There is a hydrogen here which is not shown. And then there is another hydrogen over which is not shown over here. So these two carbon atoms will be chiral carbon centers. Now we know a little bit of history and some information about the structures. So let's go and find out how do they actually work. One of the important criteria is all these chiral auxiliaries should be easily able to bind with the starting material which we call as substrate. And it goes through the synthesis and after that if it's done complete then the chiral auxiliary should be removed and it can be actually recycled at the end of the process over there. So we can typically classify these in three different steps. In step one, the chiral auxiliary is going to bind to 
the substrate and remember what I said non chiral the substrate has to be a non chiral substance step 2 is the intermediate which is formed that is now going to react with a desired reagent this could be a branch of the molecule it could be a fragment of the molecule and then it is going to temporarily bind with that chiral auxiliary so we get another intermediate there and step 3 is the chiral auxiliary is removed and then that will result into the desired product with the correct stereochemistry and we can get the auxiliary free and I know it was a lot of information and a lot of words so this is the simple way to explain the mechanism of how the chiral auxiliaries work so that's our substrate which is non-chiral that's the intermediate we talked about substrate binding to the auxiliary then the reagent which could be a fragment or the branch of a molecule and that forms the intermediate 2 which is having our kind of the product desired product but it still has the chiral auxiliary attached to it and the next step step 3 is the one where this comes out and what we get is the desired product as a single enantiomer now I do want to tell you ideally it will be perfect if you get the single enantiomer without any impurities it is practically impossible to get 100% pure substance so it still needs some purification but not as much if you do all the synthesis reactions without using chiral auxiliaries so definitely these play a very important role in obtaining the compound in high yields and pure so what are the main advantages of chiral auxiliaries one of them is it can be removed and it can be recycled it can be reused wow that's great we can probably also save some cost because we don't have to buy every time new chemicals also we will save the time because remember the regular synthesis will take a long time for something like taxol to make there are so many steps and also there are some adverse environmental impact if you have a lot of solvents to dispose of and we discussed all these in previous taxol videos so you can go and check that again if you want then using chiral auxiliary this process gives you specific stereoisomer to be synthesized and that is the major desired product so the final product will still need some purification but that can be done by simple way either by crystallizing or by chromatography so look at all these advantages and what do you think yes that is a big deal chiral auxiliaries are definitely a big deal and and they're helpful in organic synthesis of any compound which has got not just one but multiple stereo centers like taxol definitely they work their magic and make the chemistry work well guys i hope you enjoyed the video and i'll see you again in next video until then bye bye